Grace and peace to you from God, our Creator, Jesus, our Redeemer, and the Holy Spirit who sustains us. Amen. The Magnificat. Today's gospel lesson comes early in Luke, where Elizabeth and Mary are both pregnant with baby boys, and they come together in Elizabeth's household. I love this story. The lectionary tells us to only read it once, either as the psalm or as the gospel, but we had to read it twice this morning because it's so amazing. There's so much here in Luke's gospel. He bookends his entire gospel with two stories about women gathered together sharing the good news. Here in this story, it's Elizabeth and Mary, and at the end of Luke's gospel, it's the women at the tomb who are the first to proclaim the resurrection. In, in today's bookend, the young first trimester Mary seeks out the old further along Elizabeth, and they proclaim God to one another. There are no male voices in this story. Zachariah has been struck mute. Joseph is MIA, and the fetus that is John the Baptist leaps for joy, but can't speak. We simply have two women seeing each other and bearing witness to God's presence in their midst, in their wombs. Elizabeth proclaims to Mary that she is blessed among women, and the child in her womb leaps for joy. She says, blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. Elizabeth speaks a beatitude, a word of blessing to her beloved cousin. She acknowledges Mary's belief and her faith, in her willingness to participate in the fulfillment of God's word. And I think in saying this, Elizabeth is also acknowledging the fear and uncertainty that Mary must be feeling, and she's speaking a word of encouragement to her. And here is where Mary responds with the renowned song, the Magnificat. This song has been passed down for generations. It's been spoken and sung and read, this song has also been tamed and domesticated over the years to ease the anxieties of the hearers, especially those in positions of power and privilege. But this song is nothing short of subversive. It's nothing short of prophetic. It's nothing short of a cry for justice. It's nothing short of a shout from the margins. Mary and Elizabeth are both women of low status, and they are colonized from multiple directions. They are oppressed by the Roman Empire, who suffocates the Jewish people with taxes and violence and hunger. And they're also oppressed by their own people as women living in a patriarchal society and culture. We see this with Elizabeth, who before she was carrying John was barren into old age giving her no worth as a woman in a society so focused on women as mothers only. And Mary is merely a teen, pregnant out of wedlock, a dangerous position to be in, in a society where a woman could lose all social standing or worse, be stoned to death just for an accusation of adultery. These women are oppressed from every angle as Palestinian Jews living in the shadow of empire and patriarchy. And it's into this context of oppression that together with her pregnant cousin, Mary sings these prophetic words passed down from generation to generation. She magnifies God and humbly rejoices in God's gestation of new creation within her womb. She prophetically sings about God's justice about the proud being scattered, the rulers being, being brought down from their thrones, and the rich being sent away empty. She proclaims that the lowly will be lifted up, the hungry filled with good things, and God's servants remembered always. These are powerful words that comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. They flip the hierarchies of empire and patriarchy on their heads. This song is subversive and it introduces God's grand reversals, a theme that we see throughout Luke's gospel and throughout the ministry of Jesus. The idea that God shows up on the margins, the idea that God is revealed in the opposite of things. 
But too often, we get caught thinking of this song as relevant only in the past and in the future, but not the present. Mary says in this song, after all, what God has done for Israel over the years. And sometimes pastors in their sermons today go through great efforts to find stories that match with each of these things on that list. And it's not hard to do. The stories are there. You can find examples of all these promises God has fulfilled in the past. And we also often think of it as what will happen when Jesus comes again one day to usher in the kingdom of God. Maybe Mary was saying that this is what her baby Jesus will do in his life and his ministry once he's born. We know those things are true as well. That all happens. Jesus certainly enacts justice and makes sure that the last are first and the first are last. He disrupts empire and is even given the title of Son of God, a subversive title previously reserved only for the emperor. These words from Mary have been symbolized as representing only what is in the past and what is to come. This tension, this paradox, is one that's all too common in our faith, especially in this Advent season. We get caught between the already and the not yet. We know where this story ends. We know where we're going, the cross and the empty tomb. We know what God has already done for us through Jesus. And yet we wait. We wait for a baby in a manger. Advent is the new year of the church calendar. It's not January 1st, it's Advent 1. We know that God already came and yet we begin again by waiting for the Christ child. This tension is one we live into yearly in our church calendar. But I think what we often overlook when we read the Magnificat is its sheer power in the present in the here and now. Mary does not just highlight the past or merely point to the future. She enacts God's justice right where she is with a song, just as Hannah and Miriam and many women did before her in our scriptures. Mary enacts justice in that moment by speaking up and speaking out. She's not just singing about what God has done for Israel or what God will do through Jesus one day. She is also saying that a humble and lowly girl like her is a force to be reckoned with in the world. That someone like her is worthy to bear God to the world. She is standing up to empire and prophetically claiming a new way that starts today. She's beckoning us to prepare the way by flipping things on their heads. This song is a magnification of God's justice-seeking love and a call to action to enact that love in the here and now. This fourth Sunday of Advent, we light the candle representing love. We often think of love as romantic or familial love, but the Magnificat helps us to also remember God's justice-seeking love that makes room for each of us through the person of Jesus. Bell Hooks, who died this week, she says that the practice of love is the most powerful antidote to the politics of domination. The practice of love is the most powerful antidote to the politics of domination. For Elizabeth and for Mary, like Bell, love is about justice. Love is about caring enough to want better for our world. Love is about God caring enough to send her son. Love is about the new order of things where there is no place for oppressive empires and systems of domination because the most powerful king of all is a baby in a manger. Love is about a God who becomes flesh and dies for us so we never have to worry if we're good enough, worthy enough, if we are loved. Love is about creating a world where all are one in God and where all are equal and no one has to walk away hungry. No migrant has to go without a place to sleep. No mother has to struggle to care for her child. No one has to suffer alone. Love lives not only in the past or in the future, but here and now, through us and among us. We still tell this Christmas story every year. 
because it's still relevant to our lives now. We still wait every Advent for a baby named Jesus because he changes our lives now. We still sing and read and say the Magnificat because it convicts us to know our worth and enact God's justice now. We still leap for joy because the birth of Jesus is good news now. We still gather together in all our differences because we believe in God's grand reversal now. We still light this candle representing love because we, you are beloved by God now. Amen.